I want to try and walk you through a little bit of the health care bill and talk a little bit about what's in it, what, what's really there. Because like it or not, we've had a Supreme Court decision, we've had an election, it looks like this is going to be with us for a while. Now the bill itself is a little bit complex. The original bill was 2,409 pages long, uh, about 477,000 and change in words. Uh, that not being enough to reform the health care system, there was of course a second part of this, that was the reconciliation package, an additional 153 pages, 34,000 words. So altogether we had about oh, 2,500 or so pages and a little over 500,000 words of health care reform. Since the law was passed, they have issued about 13,000 pages of regulations to help implement it. Uh, they are still issuing pages, pretty much regulations coming out pretty much every day. So uh, in some cases, when you get to the questions, you're going to ask me, well, what about this? And I'm going to tell you, I don't know because they haven't gotten around to issuing those regulations yet. We still have thousands and thousands of pages of regulations to come. But at any rate, they did all this, and you know, you can see it's pretty complex. And, uh, there's very few people uh, who actually have read the, uh, the entire law. I have to say, remember Nancy Pelosi told us we had to pass it before we could find out what was in it. Uh, you know, very few people have read the whole thing, and I, you know, I don't urge you to read it. Uh, I can tell you that the 300 pages on the Indian Health Service are a real page turner. Uh, uh, but at any rate, it all boils down. It's really very simple. If you just take all of this, it all boils down to this, this is what the health care system now looks like. Uh, down here in the uh, lower far right side, you have the patient, and they make their way all the way through, and the doctor's down here in the lower left-hand corner. Now, in fairness, and in, in, in fairness to the legislation, I actually have to say this is, this is a partisan document. Uh, this was produced by the Republican staff of the Joint Economic Committee, and, and so it is partisan. And the Cato Institute is nothing if not relentlessly nonpartisan. So we actually weren't going to settle for a partisan document. We decided that we'd take a look at it ourselves. And so this is what we think the healthcare system actually looks like. <laughs> uh, if you actually look at all these, these sort of beige boxes in here, those are the 99, at least 99, new agencies, positions, commissions, czars, and so on that are going to be overseeing parts of the healthcare system under this. Now, I do say at least 99, and that is because we don't know how many there actually are. The Government Accounting Office actually looked into this. They did a study over the summer, and they said they were unable to determine how many new positions and commissions and so on were created under the legislation. Because so many of the new commissions and positions and czars and so on actually have the authority to create new additional commissions and missions and czars. Uh, so we don't know how many there will actually end up with, but there are at least 99 specified in the legislation and some new ones uh, that are uh, on their way in addition to that. So it does look pretty complex and I think it's going to be something that you know, we're still going to be digging through and finding out what's really in the bill for some time to come. That said, you really can boil it down to five key concepts. If you really want to just understand the, the rudimentary aspects of the legislation, it really comes down to these five key components. These, these are, this is the, the basic structure of the legislation. If you want to explain what's in it or understand what's in it, if you know these five things, you'll have a pretty good idea of, of what it's all about. And the first of these is the one that has gotten the most attention, I think. It, it is certainly the most controversial. This was the idea that went up to the Supreme Court with the key to the Supreme, the, this big case in the Supreme Court that we just had last summer. Uh, it is still the single most unpopular aspect uh, of the legislation if you do polling, and that is the individual mandate. This is a requirement that with a, with a couple of exceptions, there are, there are a few small exceptions, but basically it is a requirement that every American must have health insurance. And if you, that is, you either have to receive health insurance through your employer, or you must participate in a government program such as Medicare or Medicaid or some other government program. And if you do not, then you must either purchase health insurance on your own or pay a penalty, or what John Roberts now calls a, a tax uh, for, not, uh, for not purchasing that health insurance. Now, 
most people, when I, we talk about this, you know, I think there's sort of some philosophical outrage about it, and there's generally an unhappiness with the idea of a mandate. But most people figure, well, it doesn't really affect me. Uh, you know, I talk to a room like this, and I, uh, I would bet that almost everybody in this room has health insurance. And if you do, then you say, well, okay, well, you know, this is a mandate that people who don't have health insurance are going to have to buy it. I have health insurance. It's not going to have any impact on me. The thing is, though, if the government's going to tell people that they have to buy health insurance, then it has to say, what is health insurance? You know, I'm pretty sure that the policy that I got down at Walgreens for $9.95 with a million dollar deductible probably isn't going to qualify. And in fact, it wouldn't. The legislation sets out a fair amount of detail exactly what is health insurance. It can't have a deductible of over a certain level. It can't have co-payments that are more than a certain amount. And those co-payments can't apply to certain types of procedures, such as preventive care and so on. Uh, and then after you get through all of this sort of numerical stuff, and you can't have lifetime limits on the benefits that are paid out, or annual limits on the benefits paid out, you get through all of that stuff, and it begins to specify certain specific benefits that must be included in, e in every plan. And most of these are benefits that are included in most, pl most plans about hospital inpatient coverage and outpatient coverage and physician coverage and things like that. But some of them are interesting. For example, the legislation now requires that every insurance plan must cover mental health benefits at parity, uh, at the same level at which you provide for, for physical uh, ailments. It must include drug and alcohol rehabilitation therapy uh, in the legislation. It must include prescription drug coverage now, uh, which is one reason why the pharmaceutical industry spent $150 million advertising in favor of the legislation during the debate over its passage. Uh, it must include uh, uh, dental care and vision care for children until they reach the age of 18. Uh, it must include uh, the, um, autism, uh, for kids with autism. It must include educational services for children with autism uh, as part of, of part of this coverage now. Uh, and it must include, this is one of the big controversies, you've heard so much about this, it must include coverage of contraception, uh, including abortifacients, uh, will have to be included uh, in all insurance policies uh, from now on. And this is, as I say, that's part of the big you know, controversy over, over that right now. Uh, now, so what does it mean uh, for you folks if you have insurance today and you're very happy with the insurance you have today, but it doesn't meet the government's definition now of what is insurance? You know, maybe your plan didn't include contraceptive coverage or something like that, or it didn't have uh, drug and alcohol rehabilitation in there, or what, you know, but for some reason it didn't meet, doesn't meet this obligation, your deductible is too high, so whatever. Well, the, it, the news isn't as bad as it might be. Uh, you are actually, at the moment, grandfathered in, which means that if, it, if you have insurance today and it doesn't meet the government's obligation uh, or a definition of what insurance is, you don't have to change your policy unless. And with this legislation, you'll find there's always an unless. Unless you make any change to your policy. As soon as you make a change to your policy, and it's called a substantive change, but as soon as, for example, you change your carrier, you change your deductibles, you change your co-payments, you change your benefits within it, you change the payout on benefits. You used to cover uh, some procedure at 80%, you want to change it to 75 or to 85%. As soon as you make any change like that to your plan, then you must immediately bring your plan into compliance with the entire definition of insurance under what the government says, or you're no longer considered uh, in compliance with the individual mandate. So at that point, you must bring your plan into compliance. In addition to that, while I said you, could, you were grandfathered in and you could stay on your current plan, that plan is not allowed to sign up anyone new. It cannot bring anyone new onto the plan. And that means as people drop out of the plan, the pool for that plan is going to get steadily smaller, and smaller, and eventually it's simply not going to be a viable plan anymore, and one day the insurance company is going to come to you and tell you, we no longer offer that plan, and now you must come into compliance with the entire government plans. 
So what this means is that in order to meet the individual mandate, you eventually are going to have to change your current insurance and have the insurance plan that the government says that you must have, not your current plan. This individual mandate starts in 2014. Now, you can simply not comply with the mandate, in which case you will pay a tax. That tax in 2014 is, issued to, is equal to 1% of your adjusted gross income. In 2015, that becomes 2% of your adjusted gross income. And in 2016 and thereafter, it is 2.5% of your adjusted gross income that you will pay as a, as a tax uh, for not having the insurance that the government wants you to have. So that's the individual mandate portion of the legislation. Now, that's if you're buying it on your own. Most people get their insurance through their employer. What about the employer side of this? There is also an employer mandate <coughs> in the legislation. And this is a requirement that says that businesses with 50 or more employees, at least we think it is 50 or more. Uh, one of the, it is interesting in this legislation, this is one of the problems when you write a 2,500 page bill the night before you vote on it without anybody actually reading it. In consecutive paragraphs in the legislation, it says employers with 50 or more employees, uh, I'm sorry, it says with employers with at least 50 employees, and in the next paragraph it says employers with more than 50 employees. So if you have actually 50, we're not exactly sure exactly what it means. <coughs> but, uh, you know, we think it probably means 50 or more is where the, where the cutoff is. So if you have 50 or more employees, you must provide health insurance to your workers or pay another one of these tax penalty fine things. Now, again, once again, the insurance you provide to your workers must meet the government's definition of what is insurance. If you're self-insured, if you're a self-insured company, uh, all you have to do is meet the actuarial equivalent of the government design <coughs> benefit package. But if you just go out in the market and buy health insurance for your workers from the open market, then it must again meet all these minimum benefits that are specified. Which is why, you know, religious groups are very upset about the fact that they are now going to have to provide contraceptive coverage under the, under the legislation. Uh, they're, they're ch you know, churches are exempt, but church hospitals are not, or church schools uh, not. In fact, there's a lawsuit filed by Notre Dame right now that's uh, making its way through the courts about this and a number of other, other suits as well. And of course, private businesses have no exemption from this type of mandate, but it may include other mandates as well, or other benefits. Uh, you know, you might not be providing drug and alcohol rehabilitation to your, to your employees. You're going to have to uh, if you go out and buy the insurance now on this. Once again, if you have insurance today, as long that you're grandfathered in and you don't have to make an immediate change. Uh, once again, however, as soon as you make any substantive change to your policy, you have to bring your policy into compliance. So as soon as you, you know, if you make any changes along the way for the next few years to your insurance plan for your employees, you're going to have to make sure that your plan at that point complies with the entire range uh, of requirements under this. <coughs> Now, the Department of Health and Human Services, on their own website, estimates that roughly two-thirds of all businesses will have to change their current plan. Eighty percent of small businesses will have to change their current insurance plan in order to come into compliance with the legislation over the next five years. Uh, this individual and this employer mandate also goes into effect in 2014. So it's not in effect today. It goes into effect in, in, in four years, in, or in two years, in 2014. Now, if you don't uh, provide, if you do, uh, one more thing I'm going to say, to qualify under the mandate as well, and this one is a little bit vague, so much of the legislation is, it's not just that you have to offer insurance to the workers. You're going to have to actually pay, you know, a large portion of the, of the premium for the workers. And how much you're going to have to pay, well, that's a little bit hard to actually pin down right now. Uh, I was comfortable for a while saying that uh, you had to pay 60% of the, of the premium cost. Uh, then there's some things that came back and said, well, 80% of the premium cost. And now I'm much more likely to say I'm not sure. Uh, the way the legislation actually reads is it, it doesn't require you to pay a specific amount. 
it says that your employee can't have to pay over a certain amount of their family adjusted gross income. They can't pay over, it's 9.5%, I believe, of their adjusted gross income they can't have to pay. Not for the individual, not just the wages you're paying them, but for their family income. So you have to find out what their spouse is making and take that into account as well. <laughs> and then you could translate that back to the lowest amount that any worker in your company has to pay, and you can figure out, or get, you can figure out how much of the insurance that you have to provide, how much of the premium you're going to have to pay for your worker. If you don't, if you fail to provide them with the right insurance, pay the right amount, do all these things correctly, then you too might end up having to pay a fine. And I say might because the triggering mechanism for that fine is also a little vague. Uh, essentially, what happens is if you don't provide for your workers the insurance, they can then take, they can then go down to these insurance exchanges. And we're going to talk a little bit about what these insurance exchanges are in a minute. But they can go down to these insurance exchanges and buy insurance there. And if they buy insurance there, they may be eligible for a subsidy from the government to help them pay for the insurance, depending on what their income is. If they qualify for a subsidy, in fact, if even one of your workers qualifies for a subsidy, then you have to pay the penalty and fine. If none of your workers qualified for a subsidy, then the, then the mandate doesn't apply to you. Now, given that the subsidy level is effectively going to be around $120,000 a year in salary, so if you only have very high paid workers, you might, not, you might get out from under it. But if you have any of your workers are going to make less than $120,000 a year, you're probably not going to get out from under this mandate. The penalty is, there's two ways to calculate the penalty. So it should, it, it is, I say, this is not simple, you know, this is Washington designing this, so. The two ways are, one, you could have to pay a fine of $3,000 per worker that you have working for you, minus 30 workers. Or $2,000 per worker for you, for every worker who qualifies for the subsidy, whichever is less. Uh, so, the, but so figure, probably about $2,000 per worker is what you're going to end up having to pay on the fine for not providing the proper insurance to your workers, somewhere along the way uh, with that. So that's, that's your employer mandate as part of all this. The th third part of this is the insurance regulation part. This is a whole bunch of insurance reforms that went through. And some of these, some of these were initially, I have to say, quite popular. For example, there is the requirement now that says that uh, children can stay on their parents' plan until the age of 26, until they reach their 26th birthday. Uh, this was known informally as the slacker mandate. Uh, it, it say it's, it is, I say it's the 26th birthday. They're not kicked off on the 26th birthday. It's the next time the insurance plan comes up for renewal that they, they would drop off so they stay on the full year of, the, of their 26th birthday. Uh, this, this was actually, this was originally very popular, uh, particularly with the kids. Uh, but, you know, but parents actually originally liked the idea as well uh, until they actually found out that insurance companies weren't going to provide those other years of coverage for free. Uh, they actually were going to charge uh, for, those, you know, for those kids being on the policy. Uh, according to HHS uh, in Washington, they, they estimated that nationwide that it would be about $3,400 per child per year as the cost of, uh, of keeping your kid on the policy between 18 and uh, 26. Uh, and employers uh, weren't actually required to provide dependent coverage, it turns out. Uh, it turn they uh, they uh, required that if they provide dependent coverage, you have to cover the kids until age 26. But if you don't provide dependent coverage at all, you don't. <laughs> so a lot of businesses suddenly decided that they weren't going to offer dependent coverage anymore, <laughs> since they didn't want to take on that extra $3,400 per year per child in, in, in coverage. Uh, and you're finding a lot of companies have simply stopped offering dependent coverage as a result of this, which means it's not quite as popular as it once was. Uh, in addition to this, as I said earlier, you can't have uh, lifetime caps or, or annual caps on the amount of benefits that are being paid out anymore. 
uh, you can't stop at a million dollars or whatever you have to pay for the, the insurance company's gonna have to pay for the full cost of whatever the, the care is. Now, this is good for people who are sick, but it means premiums are gonna go up to, to make up for the, the result of that. Uh, and the two biggest provisions of this, the two that are, uh, that are probably the, the most talked about, in many ways the most popular, uh, but also some, I, I think, problematic. Uh, one of these is what's called guaranteed issue. Uh, and this is the basically the pro prohibition on insurance companies from not covering you if you have a pre-existing condition. Uh, now, pre-existing condition essentially means somebody who's already sick. Uh, so it's a little bit, you know, like being able to drive your car into a tree and then picking up the phone and saying, hey, Geico, now's a real good time to buy that auto policy that I've been meaning to, to talk to you about. Uh, and by the way, you have to cover this accident. Uh, so there's a little bit of, of an issue there. But you know, on the other hand, it's also understandable why they did this. I mean, people you know, are sick and they have trouble buying insurance. It's, it, it's tragic cases. It really is. Uh, you know, I told you I've been around the country debating this for years, and inevitably, you know, when I was out there to talk about this, uh, the people who were in favor of this legislation, they'd bring this woman up on stage uh, who had just been diagnosed with, uh, like, breast cancer, uh, and, and because of that, she'd lost her job. And then, she, because she'd lost her job, she'd lost her insurance, and it happened to be on the same day that the bank had foreclosed on her mortgage, so she and her three special needs children were likely to be out in the street, and she couldn't even reach her husband in Iraq where he, to tell him about it because he just had his leg blown off by an IED. Uh, and, and the story would go on, and, and, and it was very hard for me to sit there and say, well, no, she can't have insurance. Uh, so so I, <coughs> we understand why they wanted to do this. But it does create a few problems. You know, if you tell people that they can wait until they get sick before they buy insurance, you do have to ask why they're going to buy insurance when they're healthy. Now, of course, that's why we put in the individual mandate, to make them buy insurance when they're healthy, except that the penalty for, buying, for not buying the insurance is less than the cost of the insurance, uh, particularly if the insurance costs are going to go up, uh, which they are, we'll talk about. So what, you've got a real problem there. The second part of the problem is that you could, if you're going, people are going to have to sell you insurance. I mean, if somebody walks into an insurance company and says, hey, I've got stage four brain cancer, by the way, sell me an insurance policy, you've got to sell it to them. But they're also going to have to limit what you charge them. Because if you say, okay, I'll sell it to you, it's a million dollars a month for that premium, not going to be any good. So what they can, second part of this is what's called community rating. And what community rating essentially says is that everybody has to pay the same premium, regardless of your health. So if you're in perfect health and you're a 20-year-old marathon running athlete in perfect health, you'll pay the same premium as someone who's 50-year-old couch potato sitting there uh, with a six-pack and a bag of Cheetos. Uh, you know, they're going to pay exactly the same and they've got you know, diabetes and cancer and emphysema and three other diseases. We're all going to pay the same premium. Well, this is good news if you're old and sick. I mean, it really is. If you're older and you're sicker, it means your insurance premiums are coming down. If you're young and healthy, you're in trouble. Because as these premiums are coming down on the older and sicker folks, the young and healthy premiums are going to go up. They're going to have to come up to match it, and we're all going to meet in the middle someplace. And it means the young and healthy are going to pay a lot more in order to subsidize the older and sicker folks on this. And this is also going to apply to your, your group policies, your small group policies. I mean, if you have a company and you have a lot of older and employees and people with health problems in your company, you're probably going to see your insurance premiums going down under this. If you have a very young uh, employee population and your people are generally healthy and you've enjoyed low premiums in the past, your premiums are probably going to rise uh, substantially under this. So, it, it, you know, it's kind of trade-offs. Uh, within this, depending on where you, where you fall on all of this. Uh, the fifth portion of this is, as I mentioned earlier, something called the insurance exchange. Uh, the legislation requires insurance exchanges in every state. They're either federal or state or a hybrid, and we're going to talk about that as in what you should do in North Carolina in a bit. But first I have to kind of try and explain what an exchange is. And this one always is trouble for me. Uh, it really gets difficult for me to explain an exchange. And part of this is because, you know, we have to face it, I make a living by going around and making fun of Congress. But sometimes 
they really are brilliant. I mean, they, they really can sometimes think of things that I would, it would never have occurred to me. And so I want you to try, uh, and if I don't do a good job of explaining it, come back to me with questions, but I'm gonna try, just try to get your heads around this one. They have come up with this idea. They're going to create a place where buyers and sellers will come together. And the buyers will have money, and the sellers will have a product. And they will exchange money for the product. <laughs> Can you imagine that? How have we ever gotten on all these years <laughs> without Congress? Now, now, I do oversimplify a bit there. I mean, I have to say, you know, it's never going to be that simple. We're talking Congress getting involved here. So what they've actually done is they, they've said, we're going to take this new concept of exchanging money for products, and we're going to create like a giant insurance, because the private sector hadn't already done that. So they're going to create this giant insurance. And what they're going to do on the exchange is, you know, the idea is people can go on, and they're going to, they're going to actually have insurance comp uh, plans become the equivalent of airline frequent flyer plans. And people think I'm joking about this, but the legislation actually says they're going to have bronze, silver, gold, and platinum plans. I'm not, I, that's the truth. And what will happen essentially is all the bronze plans will essentially be the same, all the gold plans will be the same, the, the, the silver and platinum will all be essentially the same plan at different levels. And it, they essentially designed the bronze plan and they said, okay, that's the standard and then actuarially you'll provide greater benefits as you move up the, up the scale uh, of this. And the idea is that consumers will go on and say, well, I want to pay a certain amount, I'm going to look at the bronze plans, you'll go online, all the bronze plans will print out, they'll all be essentially the same plan offering the same benefits more or less uh, at essentially the same price and think how easy it is for the consumer. Not a lot of choice, but but very easy for the consumer to do this. If you think about what they've done with, uh, uh, with the, uh, the Medigap policies, where they have the four types of plans, lots of different op companies offer them, but essentially there's only four types of plans that's out there. It's gonna be the same thing with insurance plans <laughs> on the exchange. So that's essentially what the exchange exists for, and then they are also the mechanism through which the subsidies will flow, because the subsidies are based uh, to a large extent on these, uh, on this, I think, bronze level of plans is the level of plans that they're going to use when they determine what kind of subsidies you're going to get. Because that's the next part of this legislation, is, is they're going to essentially give people money to buy insurance. It's the subsidies and the Medicaid expansion. The subsidies, uh, once again, are very complex. Uh, it is, there's two different subsidies. Both subsidies are based on two different sliding scales. <laughs> So the subsidies are based, you go down the exchange, you get a subsidy if you're an individual or a small group. Both of these can go down to the subsidy, the exchanges. And the individuals within the small group or the individuals themselves can qualify for the subsidies. One subsidy uh, is a refundable tax credit that is based both on the income of the individual purchasing the insurance and the premium of the insurance. So the greater the, 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 greater the premium, the more subsidy they get. The greater their income, the less subsidy they get. So it's designed to offset a substantial portion of the, of the insurance premium that they get through that individual, that refundable tax credit. The second subsidy is another refundable tax credit against the deductible under the insurance plan. Again, the greater the deductible, the more the subsidy, the, gra the greater the income, the lesser the subsidy you get. So you plug all of those numbers in, and there's actually, I think Kaiser has a, uh, Foundation has a website, uh, calculator on their website and there's some other calculators come up. But you plug all those numbers in, your income, the, the cost of your insurance, the size of the deductible, the, your income again, plug all those in and you determine which of those two tax credits you qualify for based on your adjusted gross income. And ultimately, uh, you'll determine which two subsidy checks you will get at the end of the year as part of a refundable credit. Now, of course, you have to pay the insurance up front, you don't get the credit up front, but that, that's a minor glitch. Uh, that, you, that you'll calculate. And I think it's going to be a whole industry out there for the CPAs and tax attorneys trying to figure out who's going get to these, get these credits. But that's going to be in there. Now, the credits, the, the subsidies are available technically to individuals earning 400% of the poverty level or less. 
And that's for a family of four is about $88,000 a year uh, qualified for a subsidy. But there are actually some disregards in that. For example, uh, mortgages. You, the money you pay for your mortgage is not included in your income when you're calculating that, uh, that $88,000 level and so on. So you figure all, with all the disregards and things, it's going to be somewhere around $120,000 you'll qualify for some level of subsidy or less. May only be a dollar or two at the 120,000 level, but you'll you'll get some level of, of subsidy. Uh, so you get them through the exchanges, and remember, it's that subsidy. Someone qualifying for that subsidy that triggers the in individual or the employer mandate uh, that you get on that. And then finally, there's a there's an expansion of the Medicaid program, a significant expansion of Medicaid, up to pe for people who are earning uh, primarily for single childless men, but some other groups as well will will now be brought into the Medicaid program. Uh, as well as this. That's really the key components of the legislation. If you get those five things down, you've got the basics <coughs> for what's going to go on in this legislation. But I think there's some questions that I must, I must have about this point now. Uh, the biggest one I get all the time is, of course, what's this going to cost? And I could really give a short speech here just by saying a lot. <laughs> uh, because you know, it's very difficult to pin down what anything in Washington is going to cost these days. Just figure it's going to cost a lot more than we were told. Uh, and in fact, if you remember, there was a moment just before they passed the bill uh, that Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid and a whole bunch of others, they came out on the steps of the, of the Capitol and uh, they nearly dislocated their shoulder, patting themselves on the back because they had gotten the cost of this bill, they said, down to $950 billion. And, you know, I mean, it shows how long I've been hanging around Washington that I remember when 950 was actually a lot of money. Now I know, and, you know, it's a rounding error in the latest bailout. But, but you know, they, they got down to $950 billion. And we're all celebrating that. And, well, they might have been a little off. Uh, in fact, they might have actually left a few things out. Uh, for example, there's actually $115 billion in implementation costs under this bill. Uh, for example, you know, just one area of implementation is there, you know, and it's in the president's budget this year, uh, they're going to hire 4,500 new IRS agents in order to enforce the individual mandate. Uh, because they've got to have people out there figuring out, you know, whether or not you qualify for the various exemptions and whether your insurance meets the requirement and processing all these things. Well, all those new IRS agents and their offices and their staffs and all that all has to be paid for. Uh, you know, that's, that's an additional cost. And then there's going to all sorts of regulatory costs, the kind of setting up of these exchanges that we're going to talk about. That's all those costs are going to be in there. These are, in Washington speak, were all authorized but not appropriated costs, which means that they didn't actually have to count these. Uh, when, they, uh, when they determine the cost of the bill. So you have that $115 billion in there. And then there was a little bit of double counting that went on. In the, for example, there was, in, if you just went through this interminable presidential campaign, you know that we talked about, there was all this talk about $716 billion in Medicare cuts over 10 years. And <coughs> you know, what they actually, what they managed to do with these $716 billion, and the $716 billion were in there, and, I actually don't begrudge anyone $716 billion in Medicare cuts because Medicare is at least $42 trillion in the red uh, going forward. So, you know, I was saying, thank God somebody's cutting it. But, you know, there's at least $716 billion in cuts. What they did with the $716 billion cuts was they took that $716 billion in cuts, they put that in the Medicare trust fund in which they said, okay, that extends the life of the trust fund by eight years. You may remember the president actually went out here to Bank of America Park and said, you know, I've extended the life of the trust fund by eight years. Well, that's, they did by putting that $716 billion in there. Then they took it out, and they, and they used it to finance the health care bill. Only in Washington can you spend the same dollar in two different places. <laughs> so maybe we shouldn't actually count it as both being spent on Medicare and financing the health care bill. So maybe, maybe that, we should add that cost. There was also a little matter of double counting some Social Security taxes in there. And then my favorite is the fact that there was also, you know, you've heard a lot about this, and you're talking about this in the fiscal cliff debate, the doc fix. The doc fix, under the doc fix, the way the doc fix works is that next year, under current law, the way it is scheduled right now, next year, Medicare will be cut across the board 
by 36%. That's the way the law stands right now. If, if we do nothing and we hit this fiscal cliff, Medicare is going to be cut by 36% next year. Now, this has been the law since 2001. <laughs> every year, Medicare has been supposed to be cut by 36%. And every year, Congress comes to this and says, well, you know, we're not quite suicidal, so we're not going to cut Medicare by 36% across the board, and we'll postpone it till next year. And then the next year they postpone it again, and then the next year they postpone it again, and so on, and every year they've always done this. Sometimes they postpone it by two years, so that, you know, they can avoid that, but it's always been postponed. Well, in order to get that cost down to $950 billion, they assumed that this time, for the very first time, that Medicare cut would actually take place. And they really would cut Medicare across the board by, three, by $350 billion, is what it turned out to be. And then, not to say that anyone in Washington is cynical, but at the exact same time they did that, they introduced a separate bill to postpone the cuts. <laughs> and when asked about that, they said, oh, that cost is a whole different bill. That doesn't count against our bill over here. That's a whole different bill. So I just figure, think of how much your individual household budget will look, how much better it would be if you could say, hey, my mortgage is a whole different payment. It doesn't count. <laughs> no. But that's what they did. So you have to add that back in. And then there was the little fact that, of course, under the bill, you know, and CBO actually, I, I actually like CBO, and I think they do a terrific job, but they have to play under the rules they're given. And one of those is they give a 10-year score. And when this bill passed in 2010, that meant they scored it until 2020. Well. The bill didn't actually spend any money until 2014. So you got a 10-year score of $950 billion spending money for only six years. They actually started collecting taxes in 2013, so they got a free year of taxes with it. And now, of course, it's 2012, and we're about to 2022, so the cost has gone up, not surprisingly, because now we're counting eight years in the ten of spending in the 10-year budget window. If you actually were to look at this correctly, add all those costs back in, take it over real 10 years, the real cost is $2.48 trillion. $2.5 trillion, not $950 billion. So if you take all the costs of the bill into account and you spread it out over 10 years of actual spending between now and 2022, rather than shave off two years of it, you actually end up with $2.5 trillion in spending. And how is this paid for? by $1 trillion in new taxes over 10 years, and by a trillion and a half dollars in new debt over 10 years. Now, we're having this big fight over the debt cliff, or the, the fiscal cliff. The president wants $1.6 trillion in new taxes. We're spending $1.5 trillion in debt for this bill alone. So all the new taxes the president's asking for doesn't reduce the debt at all because of this new spending. Something just to keep in mind. What new taxes are there? There's 19 taxes that I'm able to figure out in this uh, piece of legislation. Uh, some of them are small, some of them are large, some of them will apply to you, some of them won't. There's an excise tax on charitable hospitals that's built in. The black liquor tax it doesn't affect anyone here. It actually is not a tax on liquor. Uh, black liquor is actually a pulp paper product that is used as a renewable fuel, uh, primarily in Wisconsin and Minnesota and a few places like that. Uh, their tax. There's a tax on drug companies. There's a special tax for Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, there's the indoor tanning service tax. Uh, this actually occurred despite the fact that Snooky personally went to Washington and lobbied against it. Uh, it is true, that's how she became Twitter friends with John McCain, uh, down there testifying on that, but she wasn't enough to stop it. Uh, there's a codification, what's called the Economic Substance Doctrine, which basically allows the IRS to reach back and disallow uh, previously allowed tax uh, deductions that were allowed in the past. They can do a reach back and disallow them uh, retroactively under this. 
Uh, there's limits uh, on uh, what HSA, health savings accounts, flexible spending accounts, and health reimbursement accounts can be used for in the future. For example, they're no longer allowed to use them to purchase over-the-counter medications. Uh, that's in there. There is a new and uh, increased penalty for if you uh, withdraw money prematurely uh, from a health savings account. Uh, there's an increased penalty on that now. Surtax on investment income. The Medicare payroll tax uh, will now apply to what's called non-unearned uh, non income, which means interest, dividends, capital gains, uh, rental income, uh, all will be now be subject to the Medicare payroll tax. Uh, so that's a, that tax, and that tax itself is going to go up uh, from the, for individuals earning more than 200,000, families earning more than 250,000, the Medicare payroll tax, which is currently 2.9%, is going to go up to 3.8%. So that will increase, that will be an increase in the Medicare payroll tax, and then that Medicare payroll tax at 3.8% will apply to unearned income, like dividends, interest, and capital gains. Uh, so, you know, not that we have investment problems in this country or, or housing problems or anything like that to worry about. Uh, there's a tax on medical device manufacturers. This is a particularly pernicious one. It's 2.5% of revenues, not income, not no adjustments or anything like that. 2.5% of revenues of, of medical device manufacturers. And by the way, when medical device is very broadly defined, people, you know, some people think medical device, oh, we're talking about an x-ray machine or an MRI unit. Crutches are a medical device. A wheelchair is a medical device. Condoms are a medical device. No one told Sandra Fluke. Uh, but, uh, but this is in there. Uh, actually, in all honesty, I expect that to be repealed this year. Uh, there's, there's actually a broad bipartisan movement, uh, interestingly led by Al Franken uh, from Minnesota to repeal it. Uh, Minnesota has uh, more medical device manufacturers than any other state in the union. Uh, so it's interesting that they would be trying to repeal that. Uh, there's the high, what I call the high medical bills tax. That is actually, right now, if you uh, itemize on your taxes and you have medical bills over 7.5% of your income, you can deduct those medical bills uh, from, your, uh, from your income for tax purposes. That's being raised to 10% before you can make that deduction as part of this. Uh, cap and flexible spending accounts. Uh, no longer can you, uh, you used to be able to have $5,000 contribution to a flexible, flexible spending account. That's being cut in half to $2,500, uh, that, uh, that contribution. <coughs> uh, <coughs> there used to be a, a, a tax deduction for employer-provided retirement prescription drug benefits. Uh, basically, if you uh, had a uh, retirement, uh, retired employee and you continued uh, on that policy uh, after you retired, it provided prescription drugs rather than going on Medicare Part D. You got your prescription drugs through your employer policy. The employer received a tax break for providing that prescription drug coverage. That's been el being eliminated. Uh, there's a cap on the deductibility of corporate salaries for health insurance executives. Uh, they cannot deduct, uh, corporations cannot deduct the salary of more than $500,000 for any, uh, any executive uh, for a health insurance company. The individual mandate and employer mandate tax, these are the taxes for failing to comply with the individual employee mandate. By the way, they expect the IRS estimates 6 million people will get hit with that uh, individual mandate tax the first year. Uh, that they expect that. There's a tax on health insurers. Uh, and then finally, the excise tax on comprehensive health insurance plans. <coughs> this is a tax that says that if a company provides a health insurance plan that is too generous, uh, then they must pay a 40% excise tax uh, on that insurance plan. So you will be penalized if your insurance plan is not generous enough, and you will then be penalized if your insurance plan is too generous in the benefits that it, offer, that it offers. Uh, so those are the, uh, the way we're going to pay for that in taxes, plus a trillion and a half dollars in debt. What about your insurance premiums? Well, when, before they passed this legislation, in fact, about the month before they passed this legislation, the Congressional Budget Office came out with a study that said, if this legislation is not passed, if there is no health care reform in this country, they estimated that in the next six to ten years, insurance premiums in this country will double, or would have doubled, if the legislation was not passed. After the legislation was passed, they did another analysis, and they determined that having passed this legislation in the next to six to ten, to ten years, insurance premiums in this country will double. 
So whatever I talk about when in terms of insurance premium increases or whatever, the baseline, the baseline that we're starting from is that over the next six to ten years, the insurance premiums you pay are going to double. So you can just build that in. Then what will happen with that? If you're a large business, by which they meant businesses with 500 or more employees, they can expect to see no change from that baseline or possibly a slight decline. They could see up to 3% savings from that baseline. Uh, so starting with a doubling, but then you see slightly less, about 3% less than that uh, if you're in a business with 500 or more employees. The estimate for small businesses, that is those under, uh, under 500 employees, would either be no change to possibly as much as 1% savings uh, from that doubling uh, over the next 10 years. Individuals, if you buy an individual policy, you will, go, you will have a 10 to 13% increase over the baseline. So you're going to pay more than the doubling. And then, remember what I said was that if you have old, you're old and sick, your premiums are going to be down under that baseline. If you're young and healthy, they're going to go up. The estimates range from a study by the RAND Corporation that suggests that for young and healthy people, their premiums will go up by 17% above that baseline. The Council for Affordable Health Insurance says it'd be as much as 95% over that baseline. Millman Associates puts it at 30% over the baseline. And these are cumulative. So if you have a young, healthy person get with an individual policy, they, they, that's cumulative over the doubling. So you could pay as much as three times what you're paying today. And in the small groups, if you have a, you know, again, that's an average, no change. But if you have a young, healthy population, you could see the individual, your significant increases. If you have an older, sicker population, you could see some, some decline. The basic rule on this is you're going to have, your insurance premiums are going up in the next few years. A lot. Now, does the legislation ration care? And I want to be very clear on this, because this is very, this, this is, there's a lot of stuff out there on the internet. There's a lot of people, people including people I respect, who've gotten some things wrong on this. The legislation does not specifically ration care. It, there is nothing in the legislation itself that will deny anyone any particular care. There's no direct rationing within it. That does not mean that it does not create structures that down the road might lead to the rationing of care in various ways, but it does not directly ration care itself. And in particular, I want to address one particular area where there are concerns, and that is something for Medicare patients called the Independent Payment Advisory Board, IPAB. This starts in 2017, and I want to be very clear about this, it is not a death panel. With all due respect to the former governor of Alaska, it is not a death panel. If you need hip surgery or you need heart surgery, your records are not being sent to a board in Washington where they're going to decide whether or not you get care. That is not going to happen under this. That's not what IPAB is. What IPAB actually is, is a base closing style commission on Medicare costs. And there really is a good reason for it. I mean, in some ways. In some ways it was not a bad idea. Not, it was not ridiculous. The thought was that, look, Medicare, as I said, by the best estimates, is $42 trillion in the red going forward. By more realistic estimates, it's as much as $90 trillion in the red. Someone's going to have to cut Medicare. But Congress hasn't exactly been a profile in courage when it comes to cutting Medicare. So they said, let's not make Congress vote on these cuts. What they did is, let's do it like we did with the base closing. So what they did was they come up with this idea that there's going to be this commission, 15 commissioners, and they're going to be charged with keeping Medicare costs under control. And what they're going to do is if Medicare spending exceeds 1% more than the increase in gross domestic product. So if the GDP grows by 3% and Medicare spending then grows by more than 4%, then this commission must make recommendations to bring those costs down, back down to 4%. So if Medicare was growing at 5%, they'd have to cut 1% from Medicare spending and bring it back down, the rate of growth back down to this. And Congress would have to accept or reject their recommendations in total. So if they came up with 42 recommendations, Congress can't amend it, can't say, well, we like recommendations 1, 6, 12, and 22. We're going to reject number 3, and we're going to cut number 4 in half. They can't do all that. 
They have to either take the whole package and say we, recommend, we accept all of them or we accept none of them. And they have to affirmatively reject them, which means if they don't vote on them, they go into effect automatically. And it means in both chambers have to reject them, meaning if one chamber, if the House says no and the Senate says yes, or the House says no and the Senate doesn't vote, which is what they traditionally do nowadays, then they go into effect automatically. And the cuts go automatically go into place. Now, again, I wouldn't have set it up that way, but it's not the most ridiculous idea. Part of the problem, though, is they said, what can they actually cut? Well, in legislation, it says they cannot actually make any of these recommendations that increase any out-of-pocket expenses or premiums for these seniors. So they can't make seniors pay any more than they already pay for anything in Medicare. They can't actually change any benefits within the Medicare program. And they can't make any changes to the eligibility for Medicare, like raising the retirement age or raising the eligibility age or anything like that. So you can't change the benefits, make anyone pay any more for them, uh, change who's eligible for them. What's left? Oh yeah, we can cut what we pay doctors. And that's the only reimbursements they make. They can't cut hospitals until 2020. They can cut, but that's only for three years, and then they can cut doctors starting in 2017. And those are the only cuts they can make. Well, what's that mean in terms of what doctors are going to get? You know, we do see this is, this is what is going to happen to reimbursements for doctors. This top line here at 100%, that's what private health insurance pays a doctor for seeing someone, and we're assuming that that's at about cost for the doctor. The dotted line there is Medicaid. We know that Medicaid pays about 74 cents of what private health insurance does, which is why it's so hard for Medicaid patients to get in to see primary care physicians, why they end up at the emergency room. You know, very few doctors will take Medicaid patients at 74 cents. Uh, right now, uh, Medicare is paying physicians about 77 cents on the dollar for what, uh, for what, they, what it costs them to, to treat patients. And you know, most doctors will still take Medicare patients, but it's becoming a smaller and smaller portion. If you stay on that line of GDP plus one, this is what happens to Medicare patient, uh, payments in the future. In just a very few years, you pay Medi people receiving Medicare less than you're paying for Medicaid. And in the out years, you're down there in the 50% or less. You begin to pay, actually reach a point where you're paying 40 cents on the dollar to doctors for taking Medicare patients. How many doctors are going to continue to see Medicare patients if they get 40 cents of their actual costs dealing with this? So we think it's going to create some potential problems. One of the very interesting things under this bill, by the way, it is not judicially reviewable. Uh, no, you doctors cannot sue uh, based on these reimbursement cuts. You can't, the hospitals can't sue. You can't go back to the courts and say, we think that they did this wrong or they calculated the formula wrong or anything like that. You cannot go to court to challenge the, uh, any of the cuts. It's also not repealable. Uh, the legislation actually says you cannot repeal it or amend it uh, in the legislation. Yeah, there's a window actually in it, six months in 2017 from January until June you can have a vote to change IPAB. After that, the legislation says you can never vote again on repealing it or amending it. Now, that's clearly unconstitutional. Congresses cannot bind future Congresses. But it does say that in there, which we thought was interesting on that. As I say, physicians may stop accepting Medicaid patient, Medicare patients. I think very likely when you start getting cuts like that, it's going to be a real problem with them staying in it. And Medicare's own actuary said 15% of hospitals and nursing homes uh, will become unprofitable and close over the next decade. Uh, particularly at risk are inner city hospitals and rural hospitals are most likely to be affected by this. Uh, so, and that's, a, that's Medicare's own chief actuary uh, who made that estimate. 15% uh, of hospitals will close uh, as a result of this. Well, look, at least we're getting universal coverage out of this, right? I mean, that's why we did this. You know, we're paying trillion dollars in new taxes, a trillion and a half in debt, we're seeing the insurance premiums going up, we're risking Medicare cuts, we're doing all of this because we want to cover everybody. You know, there's 50 million Americans, we're told, without health insurance, 
out there. I'm, we can quibble about that number. I mean, I mean, I have a lot of issues with it, but let's assume that that's, that's the case. Uh, that's why we did it. So at least we covered everyone, right? Well, no. Actually, we didn't. Uh, if you put everybody in there, we actually, by 2022, 10 years from now, there will still be 30 million people without health insurance. Uh, now, 30 million is better than 50 million, but, you know, we're talking bang for the buck. Do we really go through all of this for 20 million? And, as a matter of fact, of those 20 million, about 8 million of them aren't even getting insurance, they're just going into Medicaid. So to get 14, you know, to get 12 million people with insurance, we did all this. I can't say that's the best deal we've ever encountered. Now, some key issues for you guys here. Should you establish an exchange, state-based exchange, and should you expand your Medicaid program? What about the exchange? In many cases, you really have a Hobson's choice here. The law says that every state shall have an exchange. It doesn't require you to set it up. It says the state can set up an exchange, or if you don't set it up yourself, the federal government will come in and set one up for you. Or you can sort of do a hybrid of the two, which is what I understand your governor is leaning towards doing, is kind of being a little bit pregnant and sort of having an exchange. It's a mix of the federal feds setting it up and, the, and your state setting it up. And, you know, a lot of state, a lot of good conservative legislators and conservative governors and, you know, people I've talked to, health policy people said, look, you know, we don't like exchanges, but at least if we set it up ourselves, we can set up our own rather than have the feds come in and run it. And if we set up an exchange in North Carolina, we can design it the North Carolina way. We can do what we want here in North Carolina. We can have, you know, we can adjust it to our insurance market, and we can make this market friendly, and we can make the benefits in the, the way we want, and we can do this the way North Carolinians really want. North Carolinians really desire it. A couple of problems with that. The first is we should admit that simply no such thing as a good exchange. I mean, you really can't design a good exchange. Uh, you know, a lot of people point to the difference between, say, Massachusetts and Utah. Everyone, everyone admits that Massachusetts is an utter disaster. They have something called the Connectors, part of Romney Care up there. Uh, it is a giant, like, second insurance commissioner. It is imp imposing all sorts of restrictions on rates and uh, what benefits have to be in plans. It's adding new benefits all the time to the plans. It's driven up the cost of them en enormously. It has been an absolute mess. Everyone says that's not the way to go. Some people on the other side say, well, but Utah has something called the portal, which is not really like Romney Care. And the, the portal is a good exchange because it really does nothing. Uh, I mean, it essentially is just like a giant computer program. You go online and you can pick out the different, you know, the different insurance plans like that. But, and it also offers subsidies through it. But it's had enormous problems to sell, primarily because of what's called adverse selection. And what this means is essentially that if you're a small business and you have a bunch of sick employees, you dump them and you tell them to go down to the exchange where they can get a subsidy. But if you have healthy employees, you keep providing them insurance. And what that meant is that the people going into the insurance exchange through the portal in, in Utah were a lot sicker than the population at large. And that meant the insurance premiums in the exchange kept going up, up and up. The insurance kept going up in the portal, get more and more expensive, so regular people who went down to try to buy insurance through the portal got sticker shock. They said, well, we got to solve this, so let's create incentives to try to get the people with healthy employees to send their employees down to the exchange as well. And so it started to get ever more complex, and they've had all sorts of battles over this. I mean, it really just doesn't work, and the premiums keep going up in the portal, not working a whole lot. There is no good exchange. That said, it doesn't matter. None of it matters. Because the law specifically, Section 1311C of the law, gives the federal government total veto power over any exchange and any element of an exchange that the state sets up. It says that you can set up an exchange in North Carolina as long as you set it up exactly the way that the federal government wants you to set it up. Now, I know that, for example, that 
the governor is here has said that he wants to keep uh, the customer service aspects of the plan uh, under North Carolina control. Uh, and uh, I believe some of the, some of the uh, administrative oversight under North Carolina control, which he can as long as he does exactly what HHS says every step along the way in doing that. So basically, you get to be deputized by the federal government and do exactly what the federal government wants to do, and your exchange can be exactly what HHS says, but you can call it a North Carolina exchange. And in exchange for the privilege of calling it a North Carolina exchange, you get to pay for it. Because if the federal government sets up and runs an exchange, they have to pay for it. If you set it up and run it, you have to pay for it. And it's not going to be cheap. It's estimated that it will cost you 22 or 23 million dollars a year to operate an exchange in North Carolina. Over 10 years, the cost will be about 225 million dollars to run this exchange. If you set it up, you have to come up with that money. If the feds set it up, the feds have to come up with that money. Now, they'll probably come up with it, to be honest, by coming back to you. What they're probably going to do is charge insurance companies a fee for participating in the exchange. It's probably about, they're, they're suggesting right now about 3.5% premium tax on insurers that participate in the exchange. Of course, insurers might just decide not to participate in the exchange if they're going to get hit with that 3.5% fee. But, but that's essentially what they're looking at to do, and we don't, we're not entirely sure they're authorized to do that, to whether they can impose taxes and fees. Uh, the legislation doesn't explicitly give them the right to do it, uh, so we'll have to see if they, if they can do that. But, the, but, but if you do it, you're going to have to come up with that money, which means you're going to have to come back and charge those insurers to participate, or all insurers in the state, or have a general tax hike, or something like that if you want to pay for it, because you've got to come up with 22, 23 million dollars every year in order to pay for it. There's something else, second, second part of this, which I just, you know, which doesn't really affect most people, but I'll address it to, to legislators, and I think, you know, I can't imagine why a legislator would do this. Because this exchange is going to be a disaster. I mean, it's the premiums are going to go through the roof, people are going to be unhappy, and that means that people are going to want someone to blame. Now, if the federal government sets up the, the exchange, they're going to blame the federal government. And they're gonna, when they get unhappy, they're going to call their congressman. If the state sets it up, who are they going to be mad at when this thing blows up? So I can't imagine why any legislator would want to say, hey, I'm going to set up an exchange so that people can blame me when it blows up. But, you know, there we have it. One last thing, and this is a little tr trickier, and this, this follow me through with the logic of this one, because it's a little, and it's a little bit grayer on this, but I want to put it on the, on the table. It's, I think this is enough for not creating an exchange, enough reason, but let me just add this as well. The, as I said, the federal government can set up an exchange, state government can set up an exchange. Remember that employer mandate. Remember I said it's triggered when one of your workers goes down to the exchange and collects a subsidy under the exchange. In the language of the legislation, explicitly in the law, it says those subsidies can only be offered on an exchange that is set up by the states. Those ex law says those subsidies cannot be offered through an exchange set up by the federal government. And in fact, the, uh, Max Baucus, chairman of the Finance Committee, went to the floor of the Senate and said this was on purpose because they were trying essentially to bribe states into setting up the exchanges. They thought the subsidies would be popular and that that's why the states would set up an exchange because you could only get the subsidies on the exchange. That means if North Carolina does not set up an exchange and the federal government has to come in and set one up by itself, no subsidies would technically be available. That means it would be impossible for a worker to go down and collect a subsidy through the exchange, which means the employer mandate would never apply to any business in North Carolina. But I'm going to back now. I'm going to caveat this. I'm going to back off on this a little bit. Because the Obama administration says, yeah, that's what the law says, but that's not what we intended. 
and therefore we assert the right to unilaterally rewrite the law, and the IRS has issued a rule that says that even though the law says that, they can still offer the subsidies on the federal exchange, which means the individual mandate, the employer mandate would apply. The state of Oklahoma has already filed suit in federal court about this, and we'll have to see what happens with it. And you know, there's issues with the Anti-Injunction Act and all sorts of things, we'll have to see it goes forward. Uh, I certainly would expect, so, you know, if you didn't have a state exchange, you only had a federal exchange in North Carolina, and the, the employer mandate kicked in, businesses in North Carolina to be suing, joining these suits. I would expect the governor here to join Oklahoma's lawsuit on this. All of it is moot if you set up a state exchange, because the subsidies are available and the employer mandate does apply if you set up a state exchange. So you, you know, I, I say, I don't hang my hat on this, because, you know, given John Roberts and the Supreme Court, I'm not necessarily saying they're going to decide this. Just because the law says that, it doesn't mean that that's the way they're going to decide. But you make it all moot. You take yourself completely out of the game if you set up a state exchange, which is what the governor currently says he's going to do. So just keep that in mind. About 900, just less than a million people would be expected to participate in the exchange by 2016, and that'll rise going forward. This is the status right now uh, of what, uh, what states are doing. Uh, the, uh, essentially, the blue states and the, uh, the green states are states that are, that are setting up state exchanges, uh, state-based exchanges. The yellow states are states that have said no, they have rejected state-based exchanges, they are forcing the federal government to set up the exchanges in their states. The white states are states that have not decided, and as of yesterday, Chris Christie vetoed the exchange in New Jersey, so New Jersey is now a no as well. Uh, what you can see from this is the vast majority of states are saying no to setting up an exchange, which is going to require the federal government to come in and set up we estimate somewhere between 30 and 35 exchanges. The federal government has no money or expertise or manpower to set up 30 to 35 exchanges. And I don't think this particular Congress is likely to authorize an expenditure of additional money to set up 30 or 35 exchanges. They expect it to set up two or three, not 35. And to get these running, by the way, these have to be up and running as of January 1st, 2014, which means they actually have to be operational by October of 2013. So in the next 10 months, the federal government is supposed to come in and set up 35 exchanges in all these states. Ain't going to happen, folks. In fact, I don't even see how all these blue states are going to get their exchanges up and running by October of this year, with the exception of California and uh, uh, Massachusetts. Utah is not even, because their portal, they've already been told their portal doesn't qualify. HHS vetoed the portal and required them to make some changes to it. Uh, so they're going to have to do something different there as well. So I don't think these states are going to be up and running by 2014 uh, anyway. So just something to keep in mind. Last part of this, and then we'll get to some questions. I know I've been going on a long time. Uh, Medicaid expansion. Uh, again, the Supreme Court, uh, the, the, the law originally required states to expand their Medicaid program to all adults with, and children, 135% uh, of the poverty level or below. Now, most states already covered children and pregnant women, groups like that, at, at this level uh, or higher. Uh, primarily, what this is going to bring in is in single, childless men. This is the group that's most likely to be brought in under this expansion. Now, I want you to think about what population out there, single, childless men, for prolonged periods of having their income less than 135% of poverty and aren't currently eligible for a government program. What group are we talking about bringing in? Homeless, the mentally ill, people with chronic illnesses. These are very high cost, very difficult to, to you know, for cost control populations. These are going to be populations that are going to cost a lot for your state Medicaid program when you bring them in. Originally, the law required states to do this. Now, the Supreme Court, 7 to 2, struck that down, said you can't make states expand their Medicaid programs like this. It has to be a choice. So the, now, every state has the choice of either expanding their program or not. And the Obama administration essentially is trying to bribe states into doing it. So what they said is that for the first three years, if you do this, if you expand your program for the first three years, 
we will give you 100% of the cost of all those new people. When you bring them in, the federal government will pay 100% of that cost. And after that, it phases down. Eventually, the federal government will pay 90% of the cost of the new people, which is you know, much better than the current rate. Currently, the government pays about 55, federal government pays about 55, and the state of North Carolina has to pay about 45% of the cost uh, of Medicaid patients. So it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a better deal. Now, 10% of a very big number is still a very big number. Uh, there's also another problem with this, of course, is, and this is what the, the folks in Washington, we talk about the woodwork effect. And that is that if you're going to go out and you're going to expand Medicaid to all these new people, uh, as you begin to advertise and it's in the newspapers and you on TV and all this sort of thing, there's going to be a whole bunch of people out there today who are eligible for Medicaid and haven't signed up yet that are suddenly going to come out of the woodwork and sign up for it, even they're already eligible. They're not part of this new expansion. There are people who are eligible today but hadn't signed up, and now they're going to sign up. And when they do it, they're not eligible for that 90-10 reimbursement. They're back under the old 55-45 uh, thing. So you're going to have to pay a huge amount of the cost for these new folks that are going to come in under this. And it's estimated that in North Carolina, uh, over the next 10 years, it'll cost you $3 billion for Medicaid expansion. That's the North Carolina taxpayer's portion of this. The federal government will pay about 40, uh, 40, uh, 40 billion over that same period, but you'll pay about $3 billion of that. Uh, about 750,000 more Medicaid enrollees uh, will be enrolled. About uh, 500, almost 600,000 of them, or about, uh, about 550,000 of them will, will be uh, people who are newly eligible but about 174,000 of them will be wood, uh, woodwork effect coming in at the old rate. So $3 billion, a little bit more than that, that it'll cost North Carolina taxpayers if you agree to, uh, to expand your Medicaid program. And that's up in the air right now. Your governor has not indicated whether or not he's going to accept that expansion. So that's, that's an area that has not been decided yet. Quickly running through the timeline, a lot of the law has already been enacted. Uh, but coming up, we have some things that are coming up this year. The new taxes uh, are going to kick in uh, this year. Uh, that new tax on uh, non-investment income, the increase in the Medicare payroll tax, all of those things are going to kick in this year. Uh, we need to look at those. Uh, the mandates and such kick in in 2014. In 2017, IPAB uh, takes effect. And in 2018, the last part of this legislation, that is that tax, uh, that 40% excise tax on Cadillac insurance plans kicks in in 2018. <coughs> so that is the legislation in a nutshell. Uh, I hope I haven't depressed people too much. Uh, okay, well I have, but you know, we'll let go of that. Anyway, uh, I've been going on for, God knows, I've been going on forever, so uh, let me take a few questions and, uh, and let it go. So. Thank you all very much. I'll be happy to take any questions you might have.